we are smoothly moving to the main part of our session. It's part one. And I will be the moderator of this part. And maybe I could switch then uh, to Russian. And, dear uh, uh, colleagues, Dear colleagues, let me introduce the first speaker. So I'd like to say straight away that all speakers have 12 minutes each, and I would strongly ask to respect the timing, since the time is very limited to everyone, for all speakers. So I'm giving the floor to Ms. Dr. Maran, the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Belarus. Madame Maran? Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, I would like to thank Yegu for inviting me to this important event. It is a pleasure to share a couple of remarks on the issue of accountability for the human rights violations that have taken place in Belarus since mid-2020. My speech will focus on three key points, which I see as critical at this stage. First, my assessment of the human rights situation, and more specifically the issue of impunity for violations which I, among many others, have been reporting about these past months. Second, <clears throat> the necessity for the international community to address this situation. I'll recall the steps that have been taken so far by the UN for that purpose. Uh, let me remind, however, that as an independent expert appointed by the Human Rights Council to monitor the situation in Belarus, I am not a representative of the UN. Yet my mandate is a clog in a system which has been closely following developments in Belarus, believe me. Thirdly, at the request of the organizers, I'll mention some avenues for accountability and redress that could be explored for the most serious crimes and namely torture, given that the Belarusian judiciary system does not currently guarantee the right to a fair trial for victims. For many years, the situation with human rights in Belarus has been problematic and raised serious concerns. Yet as a result of unseen before repression, the past year saw a worrying deterioration of the situation in terms of magnitude and scope of the violations. Since May last year, over 35,000 people have been arbitrarily detained for trying to exercise their legal right to freedom of assembly. Thousands of peaceful protesters have faced administrative arrests and fines. Hundreds are behind bars, of which 270 are considered by Vyasna as political prisoners. This includes two opposition candidates who were prevented from running in the 9th of August election. Dozens of civil and political activists were pushed to exile. What is more, thousands of people were allegedly tortured or otherwise subjected to ill treatment, psychological intimidation and threats while in detention. Let me remind that the ban on torture is an absolute right, tolerating no exception whatsoever. According to governmental statistics, over 4,600 complaints have been lodged in Belarusian courts so far by victims of disproportionate or illegitimate violence on the part of law enforcement officials in the context of the post-election protests. From the available information, none has resulted in a perpetrator being held accountable for these crimes. On the contrary, hundreds of participants in protest actions are now being prosecuted for allegedly organizing mass disorders or resisting police orders. Yet, and as we have all seen from the available video records, the protests have remained largely peaceful. And the right to freedom of peaceful assembly is also an internationally recognized right. My concern now is that we are witnessing a coordinated effort of the authorities of Belarus towards criminalizing the activities of those who are trying to protect and promote human rights in the country. Various articles of the criminal code are invoked to prosecute anyone who has been connected to the protests in one way or another. In recent weeks, repression has targeted three professional categories in particular, media workers, lawyers, and human rights defenders. These people are being persecuted and prosecuted simply for doing the job. 
in dire violation of all international standards, which compel states to ensure the independence and safety of journalists, legal professionals, and human rights defenders. I would like to use this opportunity to express my sympathy to these courageous people and reiterate my condemnation of the authorities' action, which add to the overall atmosphere of fear in the country. Once again, I call them to end their policy of harassment and intimidation against civil society actors. As you must have noticed, the Belarusian authorities have remained deaf to our calls and recommendations so far. The government continues its policy of non-recognition of my mandate, and it continues to refuse to engage in a genuine, inclusive dialogue with representatives of civil society and the political opposition. Although this would be the best and probably the only peaceful way out of the legitimacy crisis that it is facing. The failure of the authorities to address human rights violations has led to a situation where impunity has become the norm. When violations remain unpunished, they go on. And this is exactly what we are observing in Belarus today. There is no evidence of official disapproval or condemnation of violence and impunity by the authorities. I am very concerned about the lack of victim and witness protection, although this is, an, this is an obligation of the state under the Convention Against Torture. Many victims are reluctant to come forward for fear of reprisals. Recently, a number of those who filed torture complaints saw their claims rejected, while others were in turn accused of committing violence against security officers. From the facts and figures communicated to us, it is clear that the law enforcement bodies, the court system, and the legislative framework do not provide adequate protection for the enjoyment of human rights in Belarus. Instead, they are often used as a means for repression. The last amendments to the Code of Administrative Offenses regarding mass protests and amendments to the criminal legislation on extremism and on measures for countering the financing of terrorism send another worrying signal for that matter. What the ongoing popular mobilization has shown is that people in Belarus want this violence and impunity to stop. The government has remained deaf to their demands, but let me highlight now that the international community does hear them. Belarus has been high on the UN agenda for over 10 years now. The current crisis has been closely monitored by various human rights mechanisms both in Geneva and in New York. On 18th of September, an urgent debate was convened at the Human Rights Council at the initiative of a group of countries, including those that triggered the Moscow mechanism at the OSCE level. The debate to which I took part alongside the Deputy Commissioner for Human Rights resulted in the adoption of Resolution 45-1, which mandated the High Commissioner, Mrs. Michelle Bachelet, to draft a report specifically on the violations that occurred in the context of the elections. She presented this report on 25th of February. A follow-up resolution is expected to be submitted to the vote of the Council by the end of the current session. The situation of human rights in Belarus has also been raised in New York, notably at the UN Security Council, in two ARIA formula informal meetings held at the initiative of Estonia. I took part in the first one on 4th of September, and on 22nd of January, when the focus was on media freedoms, my colleague Irene Khan, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression, delivered the keynote speech. We at Special Procedures have been tirelessly ringing the alarm on Belarus. Since the beginning of May 2020, that is, since the current period of escalation of violations began, we have sent five allegation letters to the government, to which it all replied. A couple more are still embargoed pending a reply, and we currently have others in the pipeline. Even though I'm not interacting with them directly, let me emphasize that UN treaty bodies have been mobilized too, starting with the Committee Against Torture. The Human Rights Committee, which is the body of UN experts that monitors how states implement the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, has registered 40 cases from Belarusian plaintiffs and has more than 200 applications under consideration. As far as I know, this is currently the highest rate of appeals to the committee for any country. <clears throat> as far as intergovernmental reviewing is concerned, coincidentally, Belarus is now undergoing its third universal periodic review. 
The UPR is a cooperative review mechanism based on interactive dialogue between all UN member states. In this cycle, Belarus received 266 recommendations, several of which addressed the current degradation of the situation. The final outcome of the UPR will be adopted on 15th of March. What more could or should the UN do? Uh, I'm sorry to remind that the United Nations is an intergovernmental organization. It has no supranational prerogatives and no authority to do more than scrutinizing states' human rights record. And even that is often easier said than done because some member states consider human rights as a domestic affair and reject international attention as undue interference colliding with the principle of national sovereignty. Other countries, however, are keen on seeing some international accountability mechanism being established. And this was the focus of several questions addressed to the High Commissioner Bachelet during the enhanced dialogue on Belarus last week. What would be the most effective and fastest way to ensure accountability for human rights violations and notably crimes of torture in Belarus? Ultimately, the primary responsibility for protection and pro promotion of human rights rests with the concerned state. So does the responsibility to ensure accountability for violations perpetrated by representatives of state structures. Yet, and as I have stressed in my 2020 report to the UN General Assembly on the topic of the administration of justice, currently the right of Belarusians to a fair trial is not guaranteed. Other key principles, such as presumption of innocence and the independence of judges, remain systematically violated too. The key concerns that I have highlighted, all of these should compel the international community to continue scrutinizing the human rights situation in Belarus, but also to consolidate its effort to change the trends I just mentioned. Beyond what is achievable through diplomacy, what international mechanisms could be activated for holding accountable the perpetrators of the most serious human rights violations? I'm here referring to alleged torture crimes, of course. I am no international criminal justice expert, and my role as a special procedures mandate holder is of a non-judiciary nature. But I have done some research bearing in mind that systematic torture can amount to a crime against humanity, pursuant of the Juskogans principle which everyone has the moral responsibility to prevent and punish. It is a so-called erga omnes obligation. According to experts, the International Criminal Court is not a realistic avenue because the Republic of Belarus has not signed the Rome Statute recognizing the competence of the ICC. Of course, judges can decide to allow the prosecutor to investigate crimes against humanity. Nonetheless, they took the decision last year with regards to crimes possibly committed in Afghanistan. And last month, the ICC also affirmed its territorial jurisdiction of a Palestinian occupied territories. But these moves should not raise too many hopes. Of course, the prevention of mass atrocities falls under the UN Security Council mandate, which can also refer crimes to the ICC or adopt a resolution establishing an ad hoc tribunal to investigate and prosecute possible crimes against humanity as it did for Rwanda, Yugoslavia, Sierra Leone, etc. This too seems an unrealistic option in the case of Belarus, however, given that such an initiative would predictably be vetoed by Russia and China. Apart from individuals, governments can face criminal liability for crimes against humanity, however. The Human Rights Council does not have much latitude here, although the idea has been aired by some members to establish a commission of inquiry on Belarus, as has been done recently in the case of Libya. However, there are doubts that such an idea would fly. This is a political decision subject to likely resistance on the part of the like-minded group of countries, which would obstruct the establishment of such commission. Moreover, the cooperation of the current Belarusian authorities is not to be expected, yet it can be doubted that a crisis of Belarus's magnitude can be handled from a distance without forensic experts and investigators being granted access to the country. To the best of my knowledge, what is now being envisaged by the states, and Mr. Emantas um, Antomenas confirmed it, is the establishment of a group of eminent experts. I'm looking forward to know 
what exactly will be its mandate and um, its uh, prerogatives. I can safely assume that should the UN human rights institutions and mechanisms be approached to contribute to the implementation of such an ID, the OHCHR will be ready to facilitate such solutions. It remains to be seen, however, with a political will and adequate funding would be found for that purpose. In the case of my mandate, which is already understaffed, lack of funding would clearly limit what I can achieve, unfortunately. Um, I will leave it here because I see that I have uh, spoken a bit too much already, and I uh, look forward to hearing what other speakers will have to say on uh, the issue we raised today. Thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Dr. Marin. <clears throat> Uh, dear colleagues, I would like to remind you that now we have a, about over 80 participants and the questions that you have, you can uh, write in the chat, they will be collected. And then we either try to answer some of the, of the questions in the end, or we would analyze them, and then we will be able to uh, respond to them later. We'll contact you and respond to you. Dear colleagues, let me give the floor to the next speaker, Professor Wolfgang Benedek, uh, the author of the famous uh, Moscow Mechanism Report is an honorary professor of Graz University in Austria. The floor is yours. So, Mr. Chair, dear colleagues, thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation to participate in this very interesting webinar. Uh, my topic is the Moscow Mechanism, the Belarus Report, and its follow-up. So let me start with a few remarks on the Moscow Mechanism. It was adopted in 1991 by OSCE to strengthen its human dimension, and it allows a group of minimum 10 participating states to be invoked in order to have a particularly serious threat to the fulfillment of the provisions of the OSC human dimension in another participating state investigated. It therefore constitutes an example of interstate accountability for violations of human rights, the topic of this seminar. The Moscow mechanism has its advantages and also shortcomings. It does not depend on a consensus decision and thus cannot be blocked by other participating states, even if they are in a majority. The only way to disable the procedure would be if the number of experts nominated and accepted in advance for the roster of experts falls under 45, which is unlikely as each participating state can nominate several experts. If the state under investigation cooperates, it leads to a mission of inquiry of three, otherwise only one expert. This has been the practice in all missions adopted against the will of the country under investigation. The experts must not be citizens of either the invoking nor the investigated states. The report is done in a fully independent way and has to consist of findings and recommendations addressed to the country of inquiry, OEC and the international community at large. It has to be presented to the permanent council of OEC, which provides an opportunity for a substantive debate. The main shortcomings are that the duty of cooperation of the country investigated cannot be enforced, that the time foreseen for the implementation of the mission of 14 days is normally too short, and that it is up to the investigated country to accept and implement any of the recommendations. There have been only four contentious cases so far, 
namely Turkmenistan in 2003, Belarus in 2011, Chechnya in 2018, and Belarus again uh, only last year. So let me say a few words on my report on a Belarus of last year. In this recent case, the mandate of the rapporteur as defined by the 17 invoking states based on the Moscow document was to establish the facts and give advice on possible solutions to the concerns raised, which were defined as intimidation and persecution of political activists, candidates, journalists, media actors, lawyers, labor activists and human rights defenders, as well as the detention of prospective candidates, election fraud, restriction on access to information, including internet shutdowns, excessive use of force against peaceful protesters, arbitrary and unlawful arrests or detentions, beatings, sexual and gender violence, abductions and enforced disappearances, torture and other cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment or punishment, and widespread impunity for all of the above. The fact-finding mission had to be done by myself as a single expert because of the lack of cooperation from Belarus. The Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, ODIR, uh, of OECE, was in charge of facilitating my mission by providing administrative and logistical support. In particular, it opened the channel for communications under the Moscow mechanism, so which I received more than 700 submissions, many of them testimonies with documents, photos, and videos of the human rights violations and their results, which together with other sources available provided a very clear picture. The findings are documented in detail in my comprehensive report with a few I wish a few to the topic of this seminar. I will focus only on the part of the mandate related to my fact finding on allegations of major human rights violations and the respective issue of accountability. As you are well aware, the alleged major human rights abuses committed by the Belarusian security forces in response to peaceful demonstrations and protests were found to be massive and systematic and unfortunately are still ongoing. The worst violations relating to systematic torture and ill treatment happened in the first days after the presidential elections, when people protested in large numbers against the twisted result. There were several killings as a result of disproportionate violence by the security forces. However, major human rights relations are ongoing until today, as can be seen from the recent report of the UN High Commission on Human Rights, international NGOs like the organization, World Organization Against Torture, Amnesty International and others reporting <clears throat> from the local scene like Vyasna. The facts assembled in my report show massive arbitrary detentions, regular beatings, and cases of sexual violence. The authorities themselves to publish the high number of arrests, which they are denying the widespread ill treatment of protesters. The letter, however, is proven by a vast amount of testimonies supported with pictures and videos despite attempts by the authorities to prevent independent reporting by journalists, citizens and NGOs and systematic shutdowns of the internet. So more than 70 web pages remain blocked. More than 400 journalists have been detained. More than 110 accused of participation in illegal assemblies and more than 90 sentenced to jail. At least nine are under criminal investigation. In some cases, firearms were used against them. One of the most important news portals, TUTBI, was stripped of its media status. The European Parliament has adopted a resolution on the ongoing human rights violations in Belarus, in particular referring to the murder of Raman Bandarenka, who was attacked by security agents in a private courtyard so harshly 
that he died from his injuries. Subsequently, a doctor and a journalist who reported about the case were detained. The purpose of the massive police brutality appears to be the intimidation and harassment of citizens, which is also taking place through threats and reprisals of different kind against staff of civil society organizations, workers on strike, student and teachers protests, defense lawyers and reporting journalists, as well as businessmen supporting the protests. The brutality of the security forces is not limited to demonstrations, but extends also to reprisals of any kind of support to protesters, as we have just heard. It is particularly worrying that the well-documented cases of torture and ill-treatment in the crackdown by the security forces on political dissent have not yet resulted in anybody held accountable as a game the UN Special Rapporteur has told us a moment ago. Together with the absence of a fair trial in political cases, this confirms allegations of general impunity. In conclusion, the right to liberty and security are under massive attack as are the freedom of assembly and association, the freedom of the media and the safety of journalists and the right to a fair trial. While protesters are criminalized, perpetrators enjoy impunity. As requested by my mandate, I have made recommendations to the Republic of Belarus, to OEC, and to the international community, which should contribute to addressing the massive human rights violations. This was done in a constructive spirit with a view to the future of Belarus as a European country based on human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. For the purpose of this seminar, only a brief summary of the most relevant of the altogether 88 recommendations in the report can be given. Belarus is recommended to immediately cease all violence, in particular ill treatment against peaceful protesters and opponents, and to unconditionally release all prisoners held for political reasons including all detainees which were arrested in relation to the presidential elections before and after. To end the use of preventive detention, in particular for administrative offenses and to refrain from reprisals and extrajudicial punishment like the dismissal of protesters and strikers. And to engage into dialogue with all actors, in particular civil society and political opponents. Further recommendations are related to the right to fair trial, the freedom of assembly and association, and the freedom of expression and the media. Regarding the topic of our seminar, namely accountability and preventing impunity, it is recommended to promptly investigate all allegations of torture, ill treatment, sexual violence and killings by security forces, including their disproportionate use of weapons by an independent and impartial body to provide effective judicial remedies for alleged violations of human rights, to ensure full accountability of perpetrators and to speedily bring those responsible for torture, inhuman treatment and other human rights violations to justice and to enable an independent, transparent and impartial international in-depth investigation on all allegations of torture and ill treatment, as well as other serious human rights violations. With regard to measures of a structural nature, it is recommended to invite the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe to assist with necessary constitutional and other legal reforms, which should include to establish a constitutional complaint mechanism for violations of human and fundamental rights, and to establish an independent complaint procedure on police behavior. However, without democratic and structural reforms, it cannot be expected that necessary legal reforms suggested will have the desired effects. And to OEC participating states and the international community, I recommended to establish an independent international body for the in-depth investigation of human rights relations in the context of the presidential elections 
with the help of forensic experts to safely collect the evidence of major human rights abuses for future trials and to bring perpetrators of torture and inhuman treatment among the Belarusian security forces and their responsible superiors to justice wherever possible, making also use of the universality principle. Now, finally, a few remarks on the follow-up. My report was presented to the Permanent Council on 5 November 2020 after Belarus did not use its possibility to provide observations within the two-week deadline. This resulted in a substantive debate giving strong support to the report with the exception of Belarus, the Russian Federation and its allies. After this, the report became public and was published in English and Russian on the website of ODOSC related to the human dimension mechanism. This allowed the report to be picked up by various international organizations and actors like interested NGOs as an additional basis for their concerns about the human rights situation in Belarus and the lack of accountability related to it. In addition, the reporter was invited to present his report at a number of meetings of international bodies, NGOs, and academic events. For example, the reporter was invited to present the report to the Legal and Human Rights Committee of PACE of the Council of Europe, the Parliamentary Assembly, the Subcommittee on Human Rights of the European Parliament, the Political and Security Committee of the Council of the EU, as well as at the side event of the Ministerial Council of OEC in Tirana. It was also presented to the EU ambassadors to the Human Rights Council in Geneva and at the side event to the General Assembly of the United Nations in New York. In this way, the report due to OEC reached a much wider number of organizations and actors concerned with its topic. Finally, it stimulated an initiative of several invoking states of the Moscow mechanism to establish a so-called international accountability platform with the purpose to secure a high quality documentation and storage of the grave human rights relations with a view to preparing the ground for national and international persecutions of the perpetrators not allowing them to expect impunity for that actions. Uh, this platform is still in the finalization stage and therefore I cannot uh, talk about any details here. In conclusion, the invocation of the Moscow mechanism in the case of Belarus in 2020 can be said to have made an important contribution to the clarification of the facts of the allegations of massive human rights violations in Belarus and the determination of policies to address this situation and thus contributed to the establishment of accountability for these violations. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, Professor Benedek, for your report generally and for your speech today. And now I have a pleasure to give the floor to Harry Paganyayla. Я хотел бы предоставить слово уважаемому Гарри Петровичу Паганяйла, главе Лической комиссии Белорусского который будет говорить о соглашении Министерством внутренних дел Республики Беларусь Федеральной службой Нацгвардии Гарри Петрович, Гарри Петрович, вам слово. The floor is yours. Одну минуту. Я хотел бы прежде всего. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the webinar 
participants and organizers for the opportunity to speak about this agreement. And do you hear me? Yes, we do. Perfectly. Thank you, Alexander. So, where do I see the danger of this agreement? I hope that the participants of the webinar know about it and they know about my constitutional legal analysis of this agreement. Uh, the story continues developing. As far as I understand, after the next meeting with Mr. Putin, our still the master of this territory of Belarus, again expressed an opinion about the necessity of military support of what's happening in Belarus, military support by the Russian Federation and its uh, law enforcement structures. It's clear that in the conditions of the growing potential of possible protests uh, actions in the spring of this year, everything will come back as it used to be. Brutal oppression of the protesters by security forces. Again, usage of excessive force. Moreover, today, when the state celebrates the day of police, BIPOL initiative published another leakage where Mr. Karaev, which has just left uh, the post of the Minister of Internal Affairs, he addressed uh, his former employees, saying that by acting in the way as they did it in the fall of 2020, he directly says there, find them and kill them, he says. This is absolutely horrible to hear. You know, this kind of treatment of citizens, peacefully protesting citizens, it cannot even, you know, like come to one's mind or one's soul or one's heart. This is kind of, a, you know, such a uh, brutal treatment, brutal attitude to peaceful protesters in such conditions, I would say that the following. First of all, this is a threat to freedoms and rights of our citizens. The Russian uh, staff of Rosgvardia, National Guard of Russia, when coming to help Belarusian state security bodies, we do not know what kind of forces are they going to represent because our law enforcement officers they do not have any uniform they wear plain clothes there is no indication like there is no name indicated or any uniform that can show that they are representatives of the authorities and they are representatives of the uh, law enforcement body. So if uh, the staff of uh, the Russian Guard, Russian National Guard, would be dressed the same way, then how can you identify them uh, from other people, uh, Belarusian law enforcement people? How can you identify them and uh, make them accountable for the crimes that, of course, they would do? on our territories, on our squares and streets of our cities. And of course, we are deeply concerned about this. And we expect this to be so. And in this case, we would like to propose both to the international community and our friends, our diasporas, and other people, as I usually say, uh, people of goodwill, to find the tools that we could use to at least now preventively, 
not to allow for the such development for such development of events and the things that we are talking about today presenting contrary reports about the situation in belarus and the necessity for belarus uh, to report to the international community what is concretely being done in belarus and what the staff of the russian national guard is doing in our territory and by the way our laws say that the presence of foreign military units for performing police functions it's not envisaged in our laws at all and in this sense the minister of internal affairs of belarus and the russian national guard when they made such an agreement they already exceeded uh, their mandate and it's clear that uh, within the framework of the current legislation such operations should be impossible but as our uh, like former president says and he has said it many times including at the meeting at the general prosecutor's office he said sometimes there are law there are times when uh, it's not the time for laws and what's happening in belarus right now and what's possibly expecting us uh, in the spring we need to react to it somehow adequately so uh, finishing my uh, speech i would like to urge all our friends to develop such mechanisms and to implement them in order to find some kind of public and also interstate and legal tools for not to allow our government to allow such a development of events that would put many of us on the edge of survival thank you Gary Petrovich, спасибо за ваше сообщение. Thank you, Harry, for your message. Dear colleagues, as far as I understand, we are finished with the first part of our meeting today. And now I think we can pass to the second part. And here I have to give my uh, moderators mandate to uh, Ludmila Ulyashina, and I will uh, perform a different function here right now. Yes, thank you very much, dear Alexander. And now you're going to make your own speech. Thank you for moderating the first part, dear colleagues, in the first uh, part of the presentation. Uh, we wanted to define the scale of the problem. And Harry uh, showed us a very good example of a very concrete uh, uh, bilateral agreement between the states and uh, this is an evidence about possible new threats. And the second part is about what kind of legal remedies we have and what can be done in the situation where we still have absolute impunity and uh, there are more and more threats of illegal actions and I would uh, give the floor and I'll be happy to give the floor now to Professor Alexander Vashkevich, expert in the sphere of international legal protection within the framework of the United Nations, and in particular uh, within the framework of the International Covenant on Political and Civic Rights. Okay, dear Ludmila, I will not read. I will limit myself to several to several comments. So as Dr. Olyashina said, I was asked 
to look at universal remedies, universal human rights mechanisms. These nine key human rights conventions, many of them establish the so-called interstate complete complaint or interstate communication institution which was known to the international law before the second world war the charter of ilo included it back in 1919 they established this possibility for member parties of the, of this international labor organization to complain against actions of another state after the world war the second one of unesco conventions also included this provision and also the european convention on human rights about which uh, professor mcbride will tell us well i will tell more about the opportunities of the international covenant of civil and political rights so up until now this is an inactive procedure however several years ago we said that it is completely inactive and never used by international universal un bodies un treaty bodies but uh, Today, at least three such complaints are under review at the committee working on racial discri discrimination based on the Convention for liquidation of for elimination of all forms of racial discrimination. And this convention is available at the website of this committee and this information. As far as the interstate communication procedure under the International Covenant is concerned, this procedure is regulated by Articles 41 and 42 of the Covenant. You can open it and read it. I will not comment on it in detail since in practice it has never yet worked. Though, though in 2011, in French, comment was published related to this international covenant on civil and, and political rights so this the chapter on article 40 was written by dr marcus schmidt from the office of high commissioner who worked on treaty bodies and he said that there had been three attempts To invoke this procedure but they never succeeded why because to enact this procedure the parties the, the states claiming that another state party of the covenant violates the provision of the covenant both states must must compose a declaration so by now only 50 such declarations have been conducted so 50 state parties of the covenant on civil and political rights can can file an application claiming that a certain state party of the covenant does not comply with the covenant obligations so among these 50 states we also have belarus which made this statement in 1992 and these states also include many european countries such as austria belgium bulgaria nordic states denmark finland the first one actually was Sweden in November 1971 Sweden made this statement and some other countries as well and the list is available on the web on the web page 
indicating the, the ratification of the covenant. But the essence of this procedure is very well explained by the Human Rights Committee in paragraph 2 of the General Comment 31, focusing on obligations of state parties of the covenant. Ms. Special Rapporteur on Belarus has already made this point. I will only quote one statement. As the committee says, each participating party is interested in uh, all other state parties respecting their obligations because the norms of main human rights are ergo omnes obligations and the states are obliged to encourage to promote the compliance. So the committee would like to remind about the Article 41 making this declaration and the committee also states that this procedure has to strengthen rather than weaken the interest of state parties in, um, in uh, the area of human rights. to draw attention to possible breaches of covenant obligations by other state parties and to call on them to comply should, uh, should comply with their covenant obligations should not be seen as an unfriendly act. It should be considered as a reflection of legitimate community interest. As you remember, if you have read uh, Antoine de saint Exupéry, we are responsible forever for those we have tamed. And uh, the states, all the states that have signed the International Covenant are responsible for those who have signed as well. So to put, to put it briefly, it is the task of the civil society, as the doctrine says, and the task of uh, non-governmental organizations, and also the task of participating states as the Human Rights uh, Committee member has put it. She is now the judge of the European Court on Human Rights, Anya Zaber Poor. As she put it, the task of participating states, since they are the stakeholders of this agreement, their task is to activate and utilize all possibilities available to encourage other states to respect human rights, in particular the mechanism of Article 41 and 42 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, definitely are not a silver bullet. However, this is one of multiple opportunities that the international community uh, should use to fulfill this task that we are discussing today. So thank you for your attention. So I have checked the list of participants and I can see many friends, colleagues, and even former students and our seminar participants. So I would like to welcome you all. I'm really happy to meet you, can at least you all. So I have, would like to give my friendly regards to you and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alexander, for this uh, deep and very to the point presentation, which I strongly hope will encourage thinking on how to make this uh, theoretical material work. Well, now I have the honor to give the floor to Jeremy McBride, our colleague, attorney, who is also a friend of the European Humanities University, and Jeremy will tell us about how this instrument works in another organization, the European Court on Human Rights, or actually the Council of Europe. And I hope that you will find it very interesting. Please go ahead. 
Thank you very much. I, I'm very pleased to be able to take part in this webinar. Um, in a way, it's strange to be talking about the, the European Court in this context, because unfortunately, um, Belarus is not party to this system. Um, but I think it is relevant for, for two reasons. One, because the experience of the European Court is the most extensive of interstate proceedings in, in the human rights field. And therefore, it's relevant, for example, if there were proceedings before the Human Rights Committee. But the other point, which I think is relevant to the discussion about the agreement that we were hearing about earlier, is that Russia, of course, is a party to the European Convention. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, responsibility under the Convention isn't limited to the territory of a state. And therefore, there may be situations in which Russia's responsibility could be engaged under the Convention. I want to talk about my experience on, of interstate cases, which is, is, as I said, limited to the European Court. There are others, uh, for example, the International Court of Justice has some human rights cases, and Ukraine, for instance, has also been making use of the Permanent Court of Arbitration to deal with some issues which have a human rights dimension. My involvement has come from being uh, the lawyer or one of the lawyers, I should say, in a number of interstate cases. Um, I drafted the application in the first Georgia against Russia case. I had some involvement and in advising in the beginnings of the Ukraine against Russia case, um, and was also most recently involved in the interstate case of Slovenia against Croatia. Um, these cases, generally speaking, are very similar to some of the problems we've seen um, in, in Belarus with very serious widespread violations of human rights affecting individuals. The situation in Slovenia and Croatia was fundamentally different. It was about the, the question of uh, representation of the interests of a bank, uh, but nonetheless it is quite a significant case for interstate cases. In all these cases um, I acted for the applicant state, except for Slovenia and Croatia, where I was defending Croatia in the proceedings. The um, nature of interstate cases in many ways is very similar to individual cases in the sense that you're dealing with proving a case, both legally and factually. But there are some features which differentiate it, and these particularly relate to um, the fact of initiation of the proceedings and issues relating to admissibility and jurisdiction. What, in terms of initiation, I think it's very important to come back to some of the remarks that were made at the very beginning, um, which are that we're talking here about a political step as much as a legal step. Uh, and mm -hmm. a state has to think very carefully before launching an interstate proceedings. Um, this will have implications for its relationship with the respondent state in the future. Um, there may be uh, very different considerations um, which will affect what um, particular entities within the in the state consider as important, so there can be a debate. And for example, in the Georgian Russian case, um, we were very clear about the what the substance of the application should be for quite some time before we actually were able to fight. We were only able to file the application just before the deadline for doing so. And that was because there were very serious discussions which were taking place within the government of Georgia as to whether or not to proceed. I don't know what was the substance because that's a political question, but I know very well there were, was a lot of reflection uh, and debate as to whether this was the way to proceed. In the end, it went through. And so, uh, there will be these significant considerations which weigh heavily on a state as to whether or not it is, is wise. Um, if you look at the nature of um, interstate cases, the vast majority of them that have been brought concern action which has affected the citizens of the state, which is the applicant, um, or in a few instances, um, ones where are closely connected with it. So, for example, in the case of Ireland against the United Kingdom, um, the violations of human rights were taking place in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom. But clearly, the, the population of Ireland as a whole had a great interest in what was happening to those people. And therefore, there was a strong interest which um, led to the case. Um, but there are some cases, uh, but relatively 
few cases where states are prepared to bring applications on behalf of people who are not connected with it. And the, the earliest was the famous Greek case, which was brought um, by Scandinavian countries in respect of the serious violations of human rights uh, when the military junta seized power. Uh, and then subsequently, there was the case brought by France and a variety of other countries against Turkey, again, where the military seized power and there were extensive violations of human rights. But since then, you don't see this kind of case happening, in part may be explained by the fact that it's now much easier to have access directly for individuals to the court, which was at the time of these cases was not an automatic right. Um, and that may be a reason why states don't feel so motivated. But there is also the question of whether they're concerned about whether it will be in their interest to, to do so. So those are political factors that weigh. At the same time, the, the respondent state will often criticize the bringing of a case by saying this is a political action by the state. Mm -hmm. But what is clear um, from the practice of the European court is that it recognizes there may well be a political dimension to a human rights case. Indeed, even individual cases uh, will have a political dimension because you're arguing about what is the, the proper behavior and what are the proper standards to be adhered to. But the court will not reject an application on the basis that it is, has a political aspect to it, so long as there is clearly a legal issue which brings it within the framework of the European Convention. And so attempts, for example, most recently, um, in Ukraine against Russia over Crimea, the court was very clear um, that there was a legal issue and therefore the case could proceed. Um, the bringing of an interstate case has some advantages um, in the sense that theoretically at least, you can have an abstract case. That is to say, you don't have to be concerned with what happens to individuals. You could simply say that legislation um, is inconsistent with your obligations. That's not possible in an individual case. But in reality, states are not going to bring such a case because they will want to see the application of legislation in a concrete matter. And I think the only likely instance uh, of where an interstate case will be brought simply on the basis of the law, will be where you have a very flagrant uh, violation of uh, a commitment that's been made. An example I would give of that would be um, a state in the Council of Europe, which decided to adopt legislation authorizing the death penalty, which goes against the fundamental mm -hmm. uh, commitment. Uh, and even without using it, I think that would prompt an interstate case, but that's a very unlikely scenario. There are certain elements of difference in the handling of cases. So for example, where an interstate case is, is launched, it immediately is communicated to the respondent state. In the case of individuals, most governments don't ever know about the majority of cases that are brought against them because they are dismissed on an admissibility basis without ever being communicated to them. Uh, so that's one, it, it shows that you can't have behind the scenes, the issue goes directly to the other state. Secondly, the admissibility requirements are more restricted. There are quite extensive admissibility conditions for individual cases. But as far as um, interstate cases, you really only have expressly stated that the need for exhaustion of domestic remedies and the six months rule, that is to say six months from the final decision in a case. In some instances, even the exhaustion rule is not applicable, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But the other, there is potentially an implied admissibility condition that an application should not be manifestly abusive. Um, and that may be connected with the question of whether or not there really is a genuine issue being put forward. This has been um, touted as an idea, but has never actually been the subject of a decision. Um, and I, I think it would be very difficult for the court to say that uh, there was an abusive application. Again, you would need a very extraordinary set of circumstances. But there is another effective admissibility condition, which actually arose mm -hmm. in the Slovenia and Croatia case, which is whether or not a, there is the jurisdiction of the court to deal with the dispute. And if that issue is raised, then the court has to judge the question whether it has jurisdiction. Now, in the Slovenia and Croatia case, the issue that was 
crucial there was that whether or not a state could bring an application to vindicate the rights of an entity which was not a non-governmental organization. The entity in question was a bank um, and the bank was had only customer was the state of Slovenia. Now, this is all a product of the breakup of Yugoslavia. There was a huge financial interest involved. But if you look at the convention, you can see individuals can bring cases if they're an individual or non-governmental organization. A non-governmental organization must not be an entity which is connected to the state. The bank had brought an individual case and had failed because it was connected to the state. Slovenia then tried to get behind that difficulty by bringing an interstate case and said, this is a different circumstance, we can bring it. But the court in that case said no, um, that a state cannot bring a case on behalf of an entity which is connected to it. Uh, it is there to vindicate human rights and not state's rights itself and therefore that case was inadmissible. But that essentially was a procedural um, condition of jurisdiction and it's important to note that questions about whether or not particular human rights are applicable, so in other words whether something is fair trial or whether something is a peaceful assembly or not, those are not issues which can be dealt with at the admissibility stage because they are questions about the compatibility of the application with the convention. Uh, and that is not possible in interstate cases, so it's an advantage. And it contrasts with the recent decision of the International Court of Justice at a preliminary stage in uh, a case of Keta and the United Arab Emirates, where, which was concerned with the International Convention and the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, uh, where the, the court said that the discrimination which is protected by the uh, convention uh, was, could, was only be possible in relation to characteristics based on ones at birth. Therefore, the acquisition of nationality subsequently was not something protected by uh, the convention. And that was the subject matter of the dispute. So in mm -hmm. other words, they threw out the case on its merits in reality at the admissibility mm -hmm. stage. That's not possible under the European Convention. Now, as far as going back to the question of exhaustion and domestic remedies, um, some of the cases which are brought into state are really just cases where the state is in a way acting almost as the representative of the individual. You have to show that the person has exhausted the remedies um, unless you can demonstrate that there were no remedies available. Um, but the court in Strasbourg has developed the concept of administrative practice which is that in some circumstances, there will be um, no um, possible remedies because of the systematic nature of the violations. And this is something which has been used in a number of interstate cases where you have a repetition of acts and official tolerance of them and constitutes an administrative practice. And in those circumstances, um, you will have um, no need to exhaust domestic remedies. What you have, however, at the admissibility stage of an interstate case is to show at least prima facie evidence that there was an administrative practice. In other words, at the admissibility stage, they do not judge the substance of the case, but they look to see at least whether you have some basis for arguing um, whether or not there was this practice. And therefore, the question is what kind of information that you might have. And so, for example, the, the report which Professor Benedict uh, authored, uh, that would be very material um, for the question of whether or not there is repetition of acts and other bodies as well producing that kind of um, evidence. And if you look at the cases, for instance, of Georgia and Russia, you will see there uh, examples of both international bodies and non-governmental bodies demonstrating the kind of problems that existed. And you need, of course, really quite substantial material and more than therefore just a few press reports. Um, and that was one of the problems also in the Slovenian and Croatia case where there was very little evidence advanced that there was an administrative practice. Um, in addition, you need to show at least prima facie evidence of official tolerance. Uh, and that in the sense is how is the state actually approving the 
violation of rights which is taking place. Um, and again, that's something which has to be demonstrated uh, with evidence, even at the admissibility stage to show that there is some basis for it. Uh, and what you're looking for is situations where there was authorization for the activity or awareness of the activity and a failure to deal with the situation. And some of the evidence that, for example, that you're getting about, um, you're talking about the courts not responding, there not being any disciplinary proceedings being brought, that assemblage of material is very relevant as to whether or not you can say there is official tolerance. There is also relevant in this context, um, the question of whether the state cooperates because under the European Convention, Article 38 requires the state to cooperate with the examination of the case. And one of the factors which was quite important in Georgia and Russia was Russia refused uh, to hand over certain circulars which were relevant to the expulsion decisions in, that were taken. Uh, they claimed they were state secrets. Uh, this was fairly implausible given that there were so many people to whom these circulars had been distributed um, for the purpose of the expulsions, uh, including schools, for example, um, that it was really unrealistic to say that this was something which was secret. But even if there had been a secret, uh, there were legitimate reasons for saying there was secret. The European Convention system has a procedure for excluding the public um, from proceedings and therefore the, need, the legitimate needs of a state for secrecy can still be protected uh, and Russia did not take advantage of that possibility. So in those circumstances it's really quite important um, that the state is willing to, to cooperate in the proceedings and there may well be conclusions drawn from it. Um, gathering data uh, about all the um, potential um, people that have been affected by the violation is very important. The kind of information that again Professor Benedict was talking about is crucial and um, in for instance the George Russia case you had there set about 4,000 people who were expelled. Um, not all of them um, were documented fully and that becomes a, a, an issue which is important uh, and it, what's if you're mounting such a case you need to be have the contact details of the individuals and you need to keep checking them because of course people change and if the proceedings may be some time after the events and therefore if you want to use these people um, as part of the case then you need to be able to contact them and one of the things about interstate cases as compared with individual cases often is the court is prepared to hear testimony from witnesses uh, and of course you need to actually to be able to get your witnesses uh, available for that purpose so those um, remain significant questions. Um, the burden of proof is not um, something which is adopted by the court. It tends simply to look at all the evidence which may be available, uh, but it does have a standard, and this is quite a strong standard of beyond reasonable doubt as to whether or not the violation has taken place. Uh, but it's a value, it involves itself in a free evaluation of the evidence. In other words, there are no formal rules about admissibility. Anything which is available will be taken into consideration. Um, so those are considerations which are, are really quite important. Um, the other final point I would think I'd make about an interstate case is that it's important to focus uh, the nature of the complaint which is made. In the situation which you face and indeed what arose in Georgia against Russia and even more perhaps in Ukraine against Russia, you have a lot of different violations of human rights. Um, some are probably more significant than others. And you, it sometimes makes sense to choose the issues on which you want to go after. Because you, the wider your claims are, the more problems you're going to have of proving all of them. And one of the difficulties, for example, in uh, Georgia and Russia was demonstrating that some of the people that were expelled actually were lawful residents uh, in Russia, because there was a difference. Many of the people were unlawfully present, but that is irrelevant to the question of collective expulsion. That, that, was, that was demonstrably uh, easy to, to show 
but to show that some people uh, were lawfully resident and therefore they ought to have had a hearing, uh, that was much harder to demonstrate. Uh, the information wasn't always there and the problems about whether you could show that information. The same thing was true about some of the claims that were they sought to make were in relation to loss of property because of course if people are forced out there's a question of what happens to their property uh, and again that was much more difficult so focusing the attention on the key issues I think is really very important because that makes it easier I think for um, the, 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 the state to establish its case and also it makes it less easy for the respondent state to try and difficult because the wider you go on the more the respondent state will respond and that will also prolong the proceedings and if you look for example at the um, Ukraine against Russia case you still haven't got beyond one of the cases getting even to an admissibility decision that's six years or nearly seven years after the events um, this will go on for much longer and part of the reason is of course they kept adding new mission map material. Russia keeps then saying, we need more time to look at this. And so delays, delays keep on going. So mm -hmm. clear focus is very important, I think, for getting um, a good result. So I'll stop at that point. Thank you so much, dear professor. Uh, indeed, it is a very, very important, complex set of techniques, advices, and I hope very much that after this webinar, we will have at least one working group thinking on interstate complaint. Because our aim, aim of our this kind of small mini lectures, mm -hmm. to attract attention to existing legal instruments. And for Belarus, unfortunately, uh, institutes of European Court on Human Rights not available, but, but interstate complaint as a, as a type of mechanism is possible to explore. And we hope very much that we meet again with you and you may share your experience with our colleagues. Okay. Thank you very much. Bernadette, Ms. Marin, take this question. How admissible can it be due to default of the law system judicial system of Belarus to appoint quasi-judicial system like judges and prosecutors by Tikhanovska, for instance, by the Coordination Council and the Assembly to consider applications from uh, victims of crimes of the perpetrated by the regime to hold uh, uh, judges, officials, and police accountable, criminally accountable. Uh, let me uh, read it once again. It's about organizing kind of quasi uh, courts or tribunals for persecuting those who are guilty in crimes of the regime. Lyudmila, I would straight on say that I, I cannot answer these kind of questions. Yeah, I understand. Uh, my prerogatives, maybe maybe Gary Pugunyailo could uh, give us his right. insight. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Benedic, would you like to answer this uh, very difficult question? Людмила, Джереми руку тянет. Ага, очень хорошо. Подождите, но я спросила. Джереми, Джереми raises his hand. Yeah. So first, I, I think there's one thing about documenting what happened, but I think you've also got to respect human rights yourself and uh, the idea of finding people guilty when they, they are not in a position to defend themselves. I mean, I'm not saying they're innocent, but um, mm -hmm. they are entitled as much as everyone to a fair trial. And therefore um, it would be wrong, I think, to set yourself up as uh, holding tribunals and finding people guilty. But 
as uh, Igor has said, and I think as Benedict's work and Anis's work demonstrate, documenting what is happening is of fundamental importance, uh, and, and therefore taking in the initiative to gather more data is extremely important for whatever kind of procedure you might want to engage in subsequently. Thank you very much. Professor Benedic, would you like to add something? No, I thank you. That I think that well, Jeremy has put it very well. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Colleagues, I then move to another question. One more question. As uh, human rights violations and torture were systematic, and uh, the goal was to intimidate the population, and um, this is actually it actually fits the definition of terrorism. What uh, do panelists think uh, about the possibility to, to designate the Lukashenko regime as terrorist regime? Government. Does somebody want to ask for this question? No. I don't see that somebody from our panel. I mean, I, I'm not sure it would uh -huh. give you great advantage. I mean, it might give you some moral satisfaction, um, but it, it wouldn't lead to any further act. I mean, you might have some sanctions against individuals, but those sanctions are already uh, being put in place for various people. So uh, I'm not sure that apart from moral advantage, th there's a slight difference in the case of Ukraine against Russia. You see there that they've been using international obligations and terrorism, but that's where you have, in a sense, military support being provided. And again, that might come back to the question of um, should something undesirable happen in terms of the relationship between Russia and, and Ukraine, then that might be a, a, an avenue to explore. But at the moment, I, d I don't think it would be a sensible one. Thank you very much. And one more practical question. What can uh, just normal Belarusians do those who are living living this country and those who who are diaspora outside the country how they can influence um, to the situation with bringing again the uh, issue and qualification of terroristic regime to international responsibility and also bringing those guilty in uh, tortures and uh, um, tortures, falsification and usurpation of power to international uh, responsibility. I would say that it's not directly into scope of our event today. So I don't think our panelists are ready to respond to this issue, but maybe um, I'm wrong. Colleagues, maybe you would ask for this question. And we have one question to you, Alexander. Насколько вы оцениваете возможность применить механизм между государствами? How possible do you think it is to apply interstate communication in line with Articles 41 and 42 of the Pact? Because at least one country out of 50 could uh, could lodge this communication, since relations with Belarus are bad anyway. So what can be the concerns of these countries? I think that to answer this question, Lyudmila, there are no legal or political obstacles for this procedure of uh, peaceful conflict regulation to be invoked, and I hope that it will. The practice of UN treaty bodies shows that this procedure starts 
working and somehow I think that it's very likely that it will be invoked. In my mind, there are no legal obstacles and there are quite many states. And what it takes is only the political will. Maybe, maybe this is what uh, the Bel Belarusian diaspora could actually do to activate these mechanisms and civil society, both in Belarus and outside Belarus. Thank you. Any more hands from panelists who would like to take this question? No? Thank you, Alexander, for helping in moderation, since actually I don't see hands, but there is one more Very interesting question. I would like to ask if the concept of responsibility to protect is applicable theoretically, practically, to the Belarusian case. Respectfully, Alexander Sonin. Would anybody take this question? Professor Benedict? Yes, uh, being also an international lawyer, I could say something on this. Yeah, uh, please. Mm -hmm. uh, the responsibility to protect was a concept which was uh, developed in the aftermath, in particular, of the Kosovo intervention, and uh, which uh, responded uh, to large-scale uh, human rights violations. Uh, it was used only once so far uh, by the UN in the Libyan case. And uh, here the criticism was very strong uh, that uh, uh, the mandate was actually overstepped. And this has uh, brought a situation that it is very unlikely that this concept uh, will be applied again in the Security Council. And the concept itself implies that you use UN procedures and that UN procedures live up to their obligations um, using all available means to protect against human rights. So uh, it is very unlikely uh, in the conditions um, of Belarus uh, in particular, but also generally uh, that uh, this concept uh, will be used uh, in the near future again, unfortunately. Uh, as I'm speaking, uh, maybe I can also put the question to my colleagues. Um, mm -hmm. And this is, uh, I'm thinking about uh, the case uh, Belgium versus Senegal in the uh, International Court of Justice, uh, where it was about uh, a torturer, Isen Abre of Chad, uh, uh, who had uh, uh, sought refuge uh, in Senegal, and uh, the question was about him being uh, put on trial or uh, being um, deported um, because of uh, his of the allegations of torture. So here we have a torture case, and we have an international court case, and also it does not fit really uh, in the, into the situation uh, in Belarus at the moment, where you don't have this prominent torturer. Um, but I still would think that it would be worthwhile. Uh, to study this case and uh, see what can be learned from it in a more general sense. Colleagues, our, um, коллеги, uh, наше время, собственно говоря, истекло, время вебинара. Я просто не имею права задерживать Thank наш... you. Our time is out. I have no right to make our panelists and guests wait. So now I would like to proceed to the conclusions. First of all, to thank our outstanding panelists, who of course have provoked, provoked a lot of thinking and uh, lots of new connections in our brains, how we can uh, contribute to fighting impunity and to make the law work, rather not just uh, staying on, on paper. We also appreciate the participants of this webinar, since your questions indicate. Though I couldn't uh, voice all your questions, but we will analyze all of them. So apart from these questions, there are also some other questions that contain ready proposals to develop this topic and probably we will use them during upcoming meetings or seminars. 
However, what will we prioritize? Well, of course, we will prioritize this topic that we are working on. So if now there are diaspora groups here or Belarusians living in Belarus or Belarusians that have left Belarus, non-Belarusians, state bodies, if you have any questions on close consultations and talks, please contact us. We will organize such meetings so that interstate communication, which is uh, admitted by Belarus as a procedure of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and also the procedure mentioned by Igor Zupov, which uh, I'm not an expert on, of course, but for this procedure, you need our service, the Center of Constitutionalism and Human Rights of the European Humanities University will stay on these topics and we will stay there as a platform where our colleagues can get new capabilities and awareness about international law mechanisms and our international experts that have helped Belarus so much so that they can see how these matters are developing. They are not abandoned. They are in the hands of experts with uh, loving hearts, and I'm sure that we will succeed. So thank you all. Uh, have a very good